Uh, 1 Timothy, the uh, 5th chapter, and the 17th verse, and then I also want to read uh, another text. I'm sorry, technicians, I didn't put this down there, but it's uh, 1 Kings, the 17th chapter, and juxtapose those two texts, and then share what I'd like to share on today. Um, thank God for another birthday, especially when all of these so many leaders have gone on to be with the Lord through this pandemic. And uh, this house should be very, very grateful that the founders of the house, as well as the current leaders, are still with us. First Timothy, the fifth chapter, and the uh, 17th verse, here begins the reading of God's holy and eternal word. Let the elders who rule well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in the word and doctrine. For the scripture says, you shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages." You shall not muzzle an ox while it treads out the grain, and the laborer is worthy of his wages. Now, in 1 Kings, I'd like you to turn to the 17th chapter, and I'm going to start reading at verse 10. So Elijah arose and went to Zarephath, and when he came to the gate of the city, indeed a widow was there gathering sticks. And he called to her and said, please bring me a little water in a cup that I may drink. And as she was going to get it, he called to her and said, please bring me a morsel of bread in your hand. So she said, as the Lord your God lives, I do not have bread, only a handful of flour in a bin and a little oil in a jar. And see, I'm gathering a couple of sticks that I may go in and prepare it for myself and my son that we may eat and die. And Elijah said unto her, do not fear. Go and do as you have said, but make a small cake from it first and bring it to me. And afterward, make some for yourself and your son. For thus says the Lord God of Israel, the bin of flour shall not be used up nor shall the jar of oil run dry until the day the Lord sends rain on the earth. So she went away and did according to the word of Elijah, and she and he and her household ate for many days. And the bin of flour was not used up, nor did the jar of oil run dry according to the word of the Lord, which he spoke by Elijah. So far the scripture, for the scripture says you shall not muzzle an ox while he treads the grain. I want to speak to you for the time that I have from the subject, take the muzzle off the ox. Take the muzzle off the ox. There are three sets of ministry gifts in the New Testament three sets. Number one, there is the motivational gifts of Romans 12. You'll find prophecy, exhortation, giving. The reason they're called motivational gifts is because they motivate us to do something. You're in a restaurant. The waiter comes with the food, slips and falls, and everything flies all over the place. The one with the gift of administration says, where's the manager? The floor is wet. The one with the gift of mercy goes immediately to the waiter and says, are you all right? The one with the gift of prophecy says, the Lord showed me that was going to happen. This is motivational gifts. They motivate us to do something. But then there is the manifestation gifts 
of 1 Corinthians 12. Miracles, healing, word of knowledge, faith. These are gifts that are called manifestation because no one has a monopoly on them. You don't really have the gift of healing because if you had the gift, you could go to Brookdale Hospital and everybody would get healed. Sometimes you'll pray for a person, they'll get healed and pray for another person and they'll die. Because the spirit manifests these gifts at his pleasure, not at yours. Mm -hmm. Because if you could manipulate the gift, then you could manipulate the people. So he doesn't allow it to be something you control. It's something he controls. But then there is the ministry gifts of Ephesians 4. And he gave some to be apostles, prophets, evangelists, pastors, and teachers. It's called the hand ministry. The apostle is the thumb. Because it is such a governmental strong office that it can touch every other gift. The only finger that can touch all of the other fingers. You running around trying to be an apostle and you haven't even made a good teacher. The apostle has experience and can touch every other area important to ministry. But then there's the prophet. The prophet is not there to prophesy up a Mercedes. They're to point to what's wrong in your life so you can get it straight and then God will give you your own Mercedes. Mm -hmm. The evangelist is the longest finger because they are the ones that go the longest. They blow in, blow up, and then blow out. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then you have, you have the... The pastor with the ring finger, where we wear that because it is said that this finger has an artery that goes all the way to the heart. And God said, I will give you pastors who are after my heart. They pastor from the heart. They are married to their wife and they are married to ministry. Mm -hmm. Yes, and then there's the pinky and that's the teacher because when, uh, like I'm doing now, you start teaching, people go to sleep. It's, it's the smallest finger. We love, we love preaching, but we don't like teaching too much, you know. You know. But you have to understand that uh, preaching will get you out the world. But teaching will get the world out of you. <laughs> yeah, so you, 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 you just can't get excited over preaching. You have to hear what I'm doing, teaching. When God says something once, it's significant. But when he says it more than once, it's critical. When God repeats himself out of the mouth of two or three, let every word be established. When God repeats himself, he says, pay special attention to this. Now, there's no book written for an apostle in the Bible. No book written for a prophet. No book written for an evangelist or teacher. But there are three books written about the pastoral ministry. That must be important. He, he didn't say much about the teacher. He didn't say much about the apostle. But when it came to the pastor, he gave us three books. Let me tell you why. The apostle governs, the prophet guides, the evangelist gathers, the teacher grounds, but the pastor guards. Yeah, yeah. Without a pastor, you don't have a God. That's why when we install them and ordain them, we give them the crozier. The crozier has the hook on the top and at the, in the bottom it's thick because it represents what David said when he said, thy rod and thy staff. Mm -hmm. The rod is the bottom because when the wolves come, he got to fight them off. The hook is if the sheep fall. 
then you hook them. You know you have a sheep when you hook them because the sheep won't fight. If you hook them and they fight, then you got to go. Because the, the, the sheep don't fight. He guards. That's why he's so important. The apostle can come in and go out. The evangelist can come in and go out. The teacher can come and go. But the pastor must stay there and guard the house. There's a pandemic going on, but I got to guard the house. Money is funny, but I got to guard the house. People are having all kinds of trouble, and I got to guard the house. The apostle may be in Africa. The, the prophet may be in the Caribbean somewhere, but I might stay and make sure that the sheep are taken care of in the sheepfold. The, they didn't have a door. That's why Jesus said, I am the door. The sheepfold didn't have a door. The shepherd laid in the door. Mm -hmm. He laid in the door so if a predator came, it had to come through him. If a sheep wanted to go out, it had to come through him. The shepherd must lay in the door. Mm -hmm. Everybody else can be free and go, but the shepherd must lay in the door and make sure the folk is all right. Because I must guard, others can guide, others can gather, but I must guard the house of the Lord. Mm -hmm. So that's why it is so important. Now note that when Paul talks about the pastor, he says, let the elder that rules well be counted worthy of double honor, especially those who labor in word and in doctrine. The word honor there is not honor of respect. Literally, it means remuneration. What it should read is, let the elder that rules well be counted worthy of double honorarium, of double remuneration, of double finances, of double monetary gifts. Mm -hmm. Th then he goes on to say, because the scripture says, muzzle not the ox that treads out the corn. Note that he compares the leader to an ox because an ox is a beast of burden. Mm -hmm. An ox can carry heavy loads. An ox is strong. You cannot be a pastor and be a weakling. You cannot be a pastor and be a sissy. You got to carry too many heavy loads. Mm -hmm. You've got to struggle with too many issues. Your shoulders have to be broad enough to carry the weight of ministry. And the weight of ministry gets heavier and heavier and heavier. And if you're not able to be an ox, you'll break up, burn out, give up, quit, and say, I didn't sign up for this. No, but we have a leader here that has stood the strain of ministry, carried the burden in the heat of the day, gone through the ups and downs and said, I'm still here and God has kept me. I'm still leading. I'm still preaching. I'm still encouraged. I'm still ready to do his will. When he called me, I wasn't all I am now, but he's made me an ox. Mm -hmm. Yes, I'm an ox. I can carry effectively. The average person in the pew doesn't realize how much pressure a leader is under and how much they must go through to be anointed enough to have power to release something in your life. Mm -hmm. God will take a leader through something for 18 months so that he has 18 minutes of anointing to put oil on you to break the yokes that are in your life. He's got to be an ox. Mm -hmm. Yes, he is the inoculation for the congregation. We know what that is. They're getting a virus. That The virus has a little of the sickness in it. And I'm, I, I know like you, I ain't fooling with no virus till I, I, I see that, that nobody took it and grew another head or their, their arm fell off. Or, you, you know, we, we got to... 
we got to test this thing, but that's not my point. It, it, is, it is an inoculation. Mm -hmm. it, it, it goes in, but it has a little of what they're trying to protect you from. So that when it comes, you have the power to resist it. Your immune system. The leader is the inoculation for the congregation. He must have the poison in him so that when you face that poison, you know it won't kill you. Yeah. So you can't have a leader that hasn't been through nothing. You got to have a leader that knows what it means to be broke because how can he preach to broke folk? You got to have a leader that knows what it means to be rejected because how can he preach to your rejections? He is the inoculation for the congregation. So God had to let him be broke. God let, had to let him cry. God had to let him have pressure and things fall apart in his life so that when he stands up here, he can tell you the medicine works. Grace can keep you when all hell breaks loose. The medicine works. When folk walk out of your life, he will come in and hold you together when you feel like falling apart. The medicine works. Even though you don't have a dime, the Lord will make a way somehow. The medicine works. When the enemy comes in like a flood, the spirit of the Lord will lift up a standard against them. How do you know? I was injected with what's bothering you and the medicine worked it kept me you gonna be kept because if God could take me through all of that and I made it then you gonna go through and you gonna make it I am the inoculation for the congregation I am your vaccine I am living proof that a pandemic can't stop God. I am living proof that you can lose your job and he can keep a roof over your head and your children can eat every night. I am living proof that you can be broken, bruised and hurting and God can pour oil and wine in your wounds and allow you to get up and lead again. I am your vaccination. And I'm an ox. That's why we call it the pulpit. Because my job is to pull you out the pit. Can everybody in here witness that you came discouraged? But there was a word from the pulpit. You came hurting, but there was a word from the pulpit. And that word pulled you you came getting ready to walk out on your marriage but there was a word from the pulpit you came here getting ready to cuss somebody out but there was a word from the pulpit you felt like hurting somebody I might go to jail today but there was a word that pulled you out the pit you walked in here broken back over leaning oh my god can I make it but then one word from the Lord and when you walked out your back was straight your chest was poked out and you said I shall not die but live to declare the works of the Lord because there was a prophetic voice and I treading out the corn giving me the weed of the word that built me like weedies and made my body strong and I can't afford to muzzle him because if I muzzle him how can he give me what I need to make it and be strong <laughs> yes 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 I want one other text. I want to be timely, but I've got to do one other text to show you that Paul emphasizes this in another place, but elaborates it because he didn't have time to do it in Timothy. So in 1 Corinthians 9, he quotes the same scripture. For the scripture says, muzzle not the ox, but he elaborates on the concept. He elaborates on it so people will know that we're not trying to manipulate them to give money to a pimp. Let the elder that rules well. 
you don't fatten frogs to feed snakes. The criteria is, have they led well? So you check and see, and there's no money mysteriously going out the account because he's ruling well, you look at the record and the reputation over time and see that it shows integrity. And you say he's leading well. You see the combination of two churches together and synergistically they're growing rather than falling apart. And you say he's leading well. You look at the mortgage that was on the building and see that it was paid off and you say he's leading. If he is leading well, then he should get double honor. And, and Paul uh, embellishes the concept in 1 Corinthians 9. Am I not an apostle? Am I not free? Have I not I seen Jesus Christ our Lord? The people will question your leadership. And they're questioning his leadership. It is part of what we do. People are going to question us. Yes, they, they're going to doubt us. Jesus went through three things. He had one disciple that doubted him, Thomas. One disciple that, that denied him, Peter. And one disciple that betrayed him, Judas. Every leader will go through a time of denial. A time of being tricked and traded on at a time of being doubted. Don't get in this thing if you think everybody going to follow you and follow you right. Just because people are with you doesn't mean they're for you. Mm -hmm. Yeah, <laughs> and, and they're doubting him. So Paul must defend his apostolic ministry. If I'm not an apostle to others, yet doubtless I am to you, for you are the seal of my apostleship in the Lord. If you want to know who I am and that I am a true leader, then look at who's following me. Look at a church in a pandemic that's almost all the way full. You prove that I've been anointed to do what I'm doing. Because he that thinketh he leadeth and nobody followeth is just taking a walk. My defense for those who examine me, who criticize me, and please don't criticize your leader. Please work with him and not against him. He's not perfect, but pray for him. Do he not have the right to eat and drink? Mm -hmm. why, why would we have a birthday service and, and talk about a leader and, and give gifts to him and send him and his wife somewhere is because the leader bleeds like everybody else. The leader needs rest like everybody else. The leader needs to sit on a beach and sip some coconut juice like everybody else. They are not supernatural. We wear an S in our chest in the pulpit, but when we get home, we're Clark Kent. And we got to deal with kryptonite. Mm, I, 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 I feed him, take care of him, muzzle not the ox. Do we not have a right to take along a believing wife as do the other apostles? Don't we have the same natural rights as everybody else? Or is it only Barnabas and I who have no right to refrain from working? Whoever goes to war at his own expense? Who plants a vineyard and does not eat of its fruit? Who tends a flock and does not drink of its milk? He's saying here, who joins the army? And after joining it, they say, all right, when are you going to pay up for your rifle? You see that tank, you're going you gonna, you gonna to drive that, but uh, when are you going to pay for it? When you join, those things are given to you automatically. So it is with the leader. If his car is given to ministry, if his time is given to ministry, if he's going to the hospital, meeting the needs of the people, then where is the thing that gives him the financial help to do everything he has to do? Mm -hmm. Because the text says, uh, who has a flock and doesn't drink of the milk? 
or a vineyard and doesn't eat of the fruit. The sheep flock, the shepherd didn't get his money from butchering the sheep. You don't have a butcher here. Well, how was he taken care of? From the wool and the milk. The milk is your offering because milk makes a body good. The body of Christ becomes strong if it has enough milk. But the wool is your tithe because it covers things. How does the staff get paid if it can't be covered? How do the musicians get paid if there's no wool? How does the leader not have to go back to corporate America and be bivocational if there's not enough wool in the house? Like in the Old Testament, in the book of Nehemiah, where the Levites had to go back to work because they weren't tithing and giving. Your offering is the milk of the house and your tithe is the wool of the house. And when the wool and the milk is here, the church can grow, the leader can rest, the staff is paid and everything is everything and God can have his way because we're not muzzling his ministry or his life watch he says you, you're the vineyard in, in verse 9 he says for it is written in the law of Moses here go you shall not muzzle the ox that treads the corn now, does he say this altogether for, uh, for our sakes? For our sakes, no doubt. But this was written that you might plow and plow in hope. And he who threshes will thresh in hope. And should you not be partaker of this hope? When I got married the first time, y'all remember Lady Lois, wonderful woman of God. And God has blessed me with another wonderful woman and I'm so thankful for Pamela. But when I got married the first time, I had $85 in my pocket. The hotel in Florida we were going to, no, that night in New York before we flew was $75. I got a new wife with $85 in my pocket. We get back to the hotel. We got all these cards, Pastor Cologne. She starts opening the cards and reading them. I said, baby, don't read them, shake them. We'll read them later. Right now, shake them. I got $10 in my pocket. Have to pay it for this hotel. Shake them. We shook out $1,500. I said, the Lord will make a way somehow. I was threshing, but I had a hope. We were struggling, but I had a hope. I had a might start. Y'all ever had a might start car? Might start, might not start. Yeah. Well, at least it had a, a 240 uh, conditioned air conditioner. Open two windows and drive 40 miles an hour and hope you catch a breeze. Yeah. People look at where you are now. Look at what you're driving now. But where were they when you had the might start? Where were they when you were struggling to pay the rent? Where were they when you could hardly make it? Where were they when you didn't know where you were going? You were blind to destiny and the purpose. He didn't know one day he would have this type of church with this type of people, but he had a hope. I don't know where I'm going, but I'm going to pre preaching, treading out the corn, blessing God's people, and leave that in his hands. And you have a hope too. We're in a pandemic, but we're not staying here. Some of you lost your job, but you're not staying there. Some of us got sick. Some of us lost loved ones. But let me tell you something. This thing will be over and there shall be glory after this. The glory of the last a house shall be greater. God pruned us. God sifted us. God gets tested us. But when we get out of this, your life is about to turn around because you've had good leadership to get you through a bad storm. If others receive this right, verse 11 and 12, should not we 
If you go, a couple of years ago, I made an appointment to go see a doctor. Forgot about it. And they called and said, you didn't make your appointment. I said, yeah, reschedule me. He said, we will, but uh, you owe us $90. I said, but I didn't come. He said, that's your fault. You owe us $90. <laughs> Doctors. I was counseling a couple in my church. And I said, this is beyond me. I'm going to have to get you professional counsel. I'll call and see what they're going to charge. I called and they said, it's 100 if it's one person. But if it's two, it's going to be 150 an hour. I called them back. I said, listen, I got a counselor for you. It's going to be a $150 an hour. Somehow, miraculously, their marriage healed. When I was counseling, it was a mess. But when I sent them through 150 an hour, all of a sudden, they lovey-dovey and kissy-kissy. And the marriage, listen, if we'll give $150 an hour for one hour to a therapist, and we're getting therapy week after week from this pulpit, why can't we give the same thing to this therapist that we give to another in their office? He gives us therapy every week. He counsels us from this pulpit every week. Muzzle not the ox. If you give 150 to that therapist, you ought to give 300 to this therapist because that therapist doesn't even know who you are. But this therapist guards and preserves you for the glory of God. Right. Let me... Let me close. I must go to the text in 1 Kings. As I close, I got more notes, but less time. We saw the principle in Timothy. We saw it expanded in 1 Corinthians. But in First Kings 17, we see it practice. Elijah is in a storm. And God says, go up by the brook Cherith. I've commanded the ravens to feed you there. Ravens don't even feed their own young. But they fed Elijah. This word is for somebody in here. God's about to provide for you in an unusually miraculous way. While we're in this pandemic, ravens are coming. Don't you turn away the ravens. Because if a clean bird won't feed you, God will send a dirty one that will. Mm -hmm, yeah, 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 yeah. Uh, uh, you'll have a neighbor that you cook soup for when they had the flu. And they'll hit the number. You didn't play the number. They played the number. And they come and say, I got $200 for you because you cook soup for me. And, and, and uh, No, you played the number. That's dirty money. Not after I get my hands on it. I clean it up. I know, I know we have some police officers in here. I hate to hate to be so brash, uh, but I got to tell the truth. You let me be coming by one of those drug raids, and they throw up a, a, a suitcase out the window with $300,000 in it. <laughs> Bishop, isn't that evidence? Yes. Evidence that the Lord will make a way out of nowhere. Evidence that God can provide. Evidence that ravens can feed you. Evidence that God can use dirty birds to help you get through a pandemic. Evidence that I shall not die but live to declare the glory of the Lord. Evidence that I've been young and I've been old but I've never seen the righteous forsaken nor his seed begging bread. I'm keeping that money, baby. That's evidence that I can do some stuff after I clean it up. Well, I may give 100000 to the cops. I'll keep the other two. 
But there comes a time where the ravens can no longer feed you. They're gone. The brook dries. I must encourage you because some of you are sitting by a drying brook. The unemployment checks have gone out. Some of you didn't even get your stimulus while they argue over giving another one. I didn't get mine. I paid my taxes. I don't know if Trump stole it. I don't know what happened. But I, I, ain't, get, I ain't get no stimulus. My wife got $30 or something. I don't know what they gave her. Uh -huh. Brooks dry. Ravens stop. But I must encourage you. You lost your job, but God's going to make another way. That job didn't appreciate you anyway. Mm -hmm. They were tolerating you. God's going to take you from where you were tolerated to where you're going to be celebrated. Yeah, 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 yeah. Some of you going to have your own business. So he had to frustrate you with a boss that wouldn't respect you. So it was stir up in you something to say, look, job or no job, I'm going to keep this until God directs me. But I know this isn't my fault destiny here. God's got something better. I'm going to trust him because the ravens are going to go away. Go to a widow's house. Wait a minute. Why wouldn't you send me to Warren Buffett or some billionaire that could take care of me lavishly why would you send me to a widow that's struggling? I don't understand how you're working. I'd rather be with the ravens. The question is, did God send Elijah to the widow so he could eat? Or did he send Elijah to the widow so she could live? Let me answer it. If God fed him with ravens, he could choose another way to feed him and he would have been all right. He sent Elijah there because the widow was about to die, eat her last and die. And Elijah had a word in his mouth that was going to allow her to survive. So he says to her, bring me some water. She said, all right, I got enough to give you that. And then he said, hey, wait a minute. While you're going, get me a morsel of bread. <laughs> Pastor Manning, she responds and says, wait a minute, I can give you water. But I'm getting ready to eat the last flour bread we have and then die. Note the word of God. Wait a minute. Cook me a cake first. Oh, greedy preacher. I told him I ain't got enough to eat and live with my son. And he talking about take care of him first. No, no, no. I ain't greedy, baby. You got flour, but I got favor. Mm -hmm. you, you got a jar of oil, but I got a prophetic word that can allow you to survive a pandemic or a famine and if you won't muzzle my mouth I'll open up to you and tell you what the Lord said if you feed me first you will not die nor your son in this famine for thus saith the Lord the meal barrel shall not run out nor the cruise of oil until the famine is over do you get that? He didn't say 10,000 pounds of flour is coming. He said the same flour container that's going to run out will never run out. Never, never. The jar of oil that's at the bottom, every time you pour, there's going to be more. That God makes a way when you're living on empty. He doesn't pull up with a truckload of money, but he'll let $200 stretch all month, and you don't even know how. 
You don't even have a job. But the children are eating every night. There's a roof over your head. You're not in a homeless shelter. The lights didn't get cut off. You're still living and don't even know how. Scoop by scoop. Poor by poor. The Lord will make a way somehow. You're making it on broken pieces. You're making it with little of nothing. But the Lord will make a way somehow. Nobody saw that $20 at the bus stop but you. You pull out an old pocketbook. I'm going to church Sunday. And I want to match my garments. Let me get that old black pocketbook. And then look in there. And there's a hundred dollar bill that you didn't even know. The Lord, bit by bit, scoop by scoop, saints. But we going to make it on empty. But we going to make it putting pieces together. But we going to make it paycheck to paycheck. But we going to make it. I don't know who I'm preaching to. But the Lord said to tell you, you're going to survive this pandemic. You're going to survive your famine. You're going to survive not having enough. He going to work a miracle. And what kills others will allow you to live. Rain is coming. Rain is coming. God's going to send rain. You're going to work again. You're going to have again. Doors are opening again. Ways are going to be made again. You will not die in this famine. God is about to open the windows of us of heaven and pull you out of blessing. There's not enough room to receive. God is about to cause your barren places to burst forth with new life and blessing. You can't give up now. You can't get depressed now. This pandemic is about over. God is about to send harvest, rain, miracles, breakthroughs, prosperity, overflow. But you got to feed Elijah first. Bake me a cake first. the audacity of telling me take my last and give it to you and you know I'm struggling well let me tell you the what the text is saying God's principle in the world is head first can I get some witnesses from the women because if you having that baby and it ain't coming out head first, you in trouble. Anything else is a breach. If the feet come out first, we got a problem. We got to turn that baby around or give us a Syrian or something because the order of God in the earth is head first. If the head comes out, everything else comes out. When she fed Elijah the prophetic head, God said, you can't feed a prophet and not receive a prophet's reward. Now, I know this has been manipulated, but that ain't happening here. I know this has been stretched out of exegetical and hermeneutical order, but that's not happening here. When you bless the head, whatever you're struggling with, God blesses you. Bring you all the tide into the storehouse. Why? So it'd be meat in my house, and I'll open the windows of heaven. Bless my house, I'll bless yours. Take care of the needs of my leader, I'll look at your needs and take care of yours. 
if you feed Elijah, bless Elijah on a 59th birthday, then God's going to say, because you blessed Elijah, I'm going to handle your issues. I had to give credence to this concept for those who are looking and say, why we got to do all this stuff for the leader? Because it's God's order. Whatever you make happen for a prophet who opens his mouth to tread the corn so that you and your family can live, you will get the prophet's reward. As I cover the prophet, I'll cover you. As I provide ravens for the prophet, I'll provide ravens for you. As I hide the prophet from the vicious plots of Jezebel and Ahab and President Trump and his craziness, I'm going to cover you. And all you have to do is feed Elijah first. I'm going to say this and then I'm going to pray. We take out of context that scripture, my God shall supply all of your needs according to his riches and glory. He didn't write that to every church. He wrote it to the Philippian church only because he said, only you gave in my necessity. I was struggling and the Corinthian church ain't gave nothing. The Colossian church didn't give nothing. Only you gave when I was in my distress. Not that I need it. I've learned how to be content with wherever I am. He said, but you needed to give it so God would give you an account. And because you have an account with him now, I got a word for you. My God shall supply all your need because you muzzled not the ox that treads the corn. Father, I thank you for those that are online, for those that are here. I hold up every family in this house. It's been hard. You've taken us to a dry, difficult season. But sometimes those seasons are to challenge our faith to see if we can tithe and give wool when we're not even covered ourselves as it would appear to offerings and give milk when we need milk ourselves and then just watch you like with the widow. Scoop by scoop, pour by pour, work a miracle and then send rain and harvest. I speak new jobs. I speak promotions. I speak businesses. I speak entrepreneurial spirits capturing your people. And instead of working for others, they work for you and themselves and have others working for them. Miraculously, like the woman who was getting ready to lose her sons, but ended up in the oil business because she got a word from Elisha. Thank you, Lord. Cover. Keep our bodies safe. Curse be COVID. Send this thing back to the sea of forgetfulness. Get us out of this, Lord. But while we're in it, make a way out of no way because we still give, we still tithe, we still honor leadership, we still take care of Elijah, and you still keep us blessing us dip by dip, cup by cup, pour by pour, scoop by scoop. Until the famine is over. I thank you for it. I know it shall be done. In Jesus' name, your people are blessed beyond measure. Overflow is here. We receive it. In the name of Jesus, I pray. Thank God. Amen. Would you give God the best?